lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I am here with uh, G.I. Greg, we'll call you. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> All right. Um, you want to introduce yourself real quick, Greg? Um, yep. So I'm from the heart of Dixie down in Alabama. I um, currently live in Tennessee. I am a Marine Corps veteran uh, and have been an oil and gas worker for the last, uh, I guess, going on 14 years. Well, technically minus one mm-hmm. since COVID and OPEC destroyed that. Um, started out, I come from a Native American slash, you know, Caucasian family. So Democrat and then military became Republican. And then while I was in the military, realized I'm not either. Mm-hmm. And that began my path to what I didn't realize at the time was libertarianism and then have just done more research into it. So I'm... Um, Learning still, playing with the ideas of it and realizing more and more the people that I interact with are more leaning towards that direction. It's like, well, do you, what's your stance on this? What's your stance on that? Yeah, you're not a Republican. Yeah. You're more libertarian than you realize. Mm-hmm. So trying to spread the gospel, so to speak, I guess. <laughs> Sweet. Well, we're certainly happy to have you here. Um, and I, I've known Greg for a very, very long time. So. Um, this yeah, is this is kind of exciting to have uh, a, another co-host for a I'm cast. Trying to do it for two years, it just never works out. Yeah, uh, <laughs> always ends up around Christmas, and then no, oh, yeah, we should do it, and then it never happens. Yeah. So Merry Christmas, everyone. This is this is actually the day after Christmas that we're recording, um, and uh, Happy birthday to uh, Gary's wife and Carter and Carter. <laughs> so. Um, I guess uh, we're just going to go ahead and jump right into it. We were we were talking last night about uh, Biden's um, new group of people, and uh, well, I guess it started with uh, I was talking to uh, someone about who absolutely despises Donald Trump, which I don't blame her for. Join the club, and, not my club, but a club. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, so I, I was telling her that I thought that Biden was going to be worse than the things mm-hmm. that I care about. Um, which is, of course, you know, mostly foreign policy stuff, because I think that the the trickle down effect of our imperial policy um, is is what, in a lot of ways, leads to the surveillance, security, police state that we have which been is, developing here. Yeah, they just carried on from the Obama administration, which Biden mm-hmm. had a hand in, mm-hmm. um, and has continued to carry it forward. And then, like you were saying, well, you know, okay, what's the new policy? He doesn't even have one. Yeah. He doesn't have any, you ask him, what are your ideas? What are your thoughts? How are you going to make it better? We're just going to make it better. And it's like, mm-hmm. okay, wasn't the guy before you saying the same stuff? He has no plans and everyone craps all over him for what's your, what's your foreign policy plan? And now you're the same way, but we're supposed to ignore it, I mm-hmm. guess. I, I don't yeah. know. It just seems the hypocrisy in both is what frustrates me a lot about the two party system. It's like, let's just ignore what we don't like yeah. and pretend. Well, I get a kick out of the Biden's slogan, the build back better, um, is another way of saying Mer- make America great again, yeah. isn't that? It's the exact same thing. Yeah. And let's do it with the same people that Obama used. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Well, uh, I'm certainly, you know, most worried about the foreign policy. Well, um, you know, there are some reasons to believe that Biden would be opposed to an imperial policy. Uh, there were better reasons to believe that Trump would have been and and he, he didn't wasn't. accomplish very much. I mean, it's it's a pretty low bar when you say, well, at least this president didn't start a new war. He's the first one since Jimmy Carter to <laughs> do that. carried on the same one. <laughs> yeah. And he expanded everything that, yeah. that already existed. And um, they couldn't even get us out of, you know, Somalia or Sudan or Syria. Well, and like you guys were talking about, I can't remember which podcast it was. That was something I was surprised. Like most people don't even know. I was one of them. I didn't realize that we were still in Somalia. Yeah. I had no idea. No, no clue. And it's like, oh, wow. Okay. How uninformed. And I try to look for that stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's weird to think about, um, the average American has no idea not to be offensive to them, but it's just, well, it's, I mean, we don't do war the same as we used to. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually, that's, you know, this isn't on our list of topics, but it's worth mentioning the, um, the NDAA that, they're, that uh, Trump just vetoed that will end up being approved again by the... So what specifically is that, the NDAA? Um, it's the National Defense Authorization Act. Okay. It's essentially what funds the military every year. Well, And... Um, it's, you know, it's bloated as always, but one of the main issues that I have with it is that they did insert um, some language saying that the um, to 
limit the president's ability to withdraw troops from. Oh, so once they're there, let's stay there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, Congress has has given up on their duty to declare war, and now they're trying to prevent the president from ending them, too. I suppose they'll push that off on the uh, the uh, Supreme Court, too, mm-hmm. eventually. It seems like that's who decides everything. Legislators don't legislate anymore. Let's just push it off on these people that we can then blame and say, well, mm-hmm. we voted for the good ones, but not the bad ones, so it's okay. Yeah, And the funny aspect to, to the them refusing to declare war but also preventing the president from ending it, like making it impossible to end a mm-hmm. war, is that they're feeding both sides, right? Um, so they don't have to go on record supporting a war so that they can keep their votes. Oh, yeah, they can stay lily white, exactly. Mm-hmm. Well, I wasn't against it. Yeah, yeah. And then um, they uh, they don't have to do anything extra to prevent the president from ending a war. Um, and so they get to continue to collect from the military-industrial complex l- lobbying. Um, so they have now set up a, a rule within their own, uh, you know, group within within Congress to make it so that the, that wars can't end, and that helps their lobbyists. Well, that was the thing. But that, they don't have to declare it in the first place, which helps their voting. See, that used to be a title that just the mm-hmm. Marines got to do the president's own. You didn't have to declare a war to send in Marines because mm-hmm. they answered directly to him. Mm-hmm. But I guess it doesn't matter anymore. No. No. They'll just all do it. <laughs> Anybody can declare it and no one can end it. That's nuts. Yeah. Um, and, and we don't fix anyone when they come back either. All the people that are ruined by war. Mm-hmm. I'm not one of them, but didn't have that pleasure. Never got to play in the football game, just practiced for it. Yeah, I, I, that's just as well. I'm really I know, happy that you didn't. Every, everyone <laughs> that says that the never same called thing. your number. <laughs> but I mean, that's the way I always equate it to people. Mm-hmm. It's like, okay, well, imagine you practice for some sport that you were super excited about, or mm-hmm. you know, some type of uh, performance. You know, you're a violinist, whatever it may be. Mm-hmm. Insert, and then you never get to play on that big stage. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of like, okay, but half of your buddies did you know, and everyone else, you know, and it, it is kind of a morbid thing where you're mm-hmm. like, oh, I didn't get to go see Carnage and, you know, all these, I didn't see my buddies die. Mm-hmm. And I see my buddies that did come back that see that stuff that are not well equipped. Mm-hmm. And you could say by our government. I don't know. I always hate that statement. I've always, I was telling you that the other night when mm-hmm. people say, and it was a quote stolen from Scott Horton, I think, um, when people say the government, they just mean other people. Mm-hmm. But I think the government still does have, well, its its whole purpose is to serve us, have a responsibility to the people that maybe they, well, I don't know that they ruined, but they helped ruin. Yeah. I don't know. Tangent. I Well, and I think that um, that part of that unprepared isn't, it's, it's still the government's responsibility in a lot of ways uh, because I think it comes out of public schooling. Um, hmm. That we don't prepare people how to deal with stress in public schools. Um, See, and I've always, I've always thought a lot of that comes with personal responsibility. Like I, I agree with you, but well, we don't teach people personal I responsibility in public problem. school. I was talking about it with my kids, <laughs> and it's like you know, I feel like half of them are underprepared, and the other ones they don't understand. Like, oh, everyone has anxiety now, and it's mm-hmm. like, yeah, we do too. As yeah. your parents, we just dealt with it differently. You just mm-hmm. toughed it out, but now it's I don't know over-medicated, and that's a completely different subject. But, yeah, schools don't do a good job either. Yeah. 100% they don't. Yeah, there's no coping mechanisms taught anymore. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, it's they're coddled to a degree that they can't handle even the, you know, the slimmest level of stress. Did you have civics class? I mean, we didn't. Um, I... I don't think that it was called civics, but I had like a U.S. government class. Yeah, I remember we had American history, but it was, mm-hmm. and she wasn't a bad teacher. I can't remember her name right now. Anyway. I had Dr. Hicks for U.S. government. He is this old hippie. Um, he would like march across the room talking about those damn carpetbaggers <laughs> from the north. And it was a, it was an entertaining class. That sounds like fun. <laughs> um, but, you know, back to Biden's, uh, Biden's team here. He's, he, well... Oh, Biden yeah. himself um, lost his good son, uh, not the one that's been in the news all all the time recently, but oh, lost yeah, his um, lost his good son uh, to the um, to brain cancer from the burn pits. 
uh, over in Afghanistan. What's the word they use? Uh, the military would use suspected, you know, or you, mm-hmm. you can't say that it's 100% guaranteed uh, that that's where it came from. Sure. You can't sure. prove it. Mm-hmm. Well, it's been... It's relatively yeah. settled at this point, I think. And and Biden's aware of that, and Biden promoted those wars. And um, all right, yeah, maybe maybe it was in Iraq. I can't remember now where his, his son was serving. But at any rate, um, I think that, you know, I think that Biden is aware, has accepted at this point that it was his his wars that killed his kid, um, that— and yeah. that he's somewhat responsible for that. And I think that that has had an impact on his willingness to go to war. He supposedly, reportedly, um, was the person inside the administration that was uh, inside the Obama administration that was against intervening in Libya. Yeah, that was one thing I did read about. And I was mm-hmm. like, oh, OK, he's pro ev- pro everything else, but no, no mm-hmm. to Libya. Yeah. Um, but of course, he was really involved in the Ukraine stuff. So it's not that oh, I didn't think about that. Yeah that he doesn't want war. Of course, he might have been getting kickbacks from that, and nobody in Libya was offering to pay him, so perhaps that's the, the reason why. Maybe it has nothing to do with well, his willingness to go to war at all. Maybe it, maybe it depends on it. the payoff. Yeah, he jokes about it on national TV about, mm-hmm. uh, oh, I told him if they didn't get people fired, then they weren't going to get the money, and it's like, okay, well, how deep does that go? That's just mm-hmm. what he allowed us to see. Yeah. But, yeah, that was doing research on this, too. I didn't realize all the people that he intends to fill his cabinet with... Mm-hmm are they've started well what are they i don't know the acronym names you do the cnas and the csis yeah um cnas is the center for new american security which is a pro-military think tank um essentially and that's i mean it you know when you start talking about those people's involvement in those kinds of things it's not i would say it's not quite as bad as the national endowment for democracy but it's damn close um and uh so yeah, all all of these people are involved in these various think tanks. That's it's all a whole bunch of military corporate. Um, Linda Thomas Greenfield, who's going to be his UN ambassador. Mm-hmm. Jake Sullivan is a national security advisor who helped create the Macro Advisory Partners, which I have no idea. I guess they're just some kind of cloak and dagger. Mm-hmm. I can never pronounce that lady's name. You said Mliche. Uh It's uh, Michelle Flournoy. Yeah, who was. Considered for the Pentagon, but was uh, ended up not getting it. Some retired mm-hmm. general did. Yeah, remember. and that's a good thing because yep. she was one of the big um, cheerleaders for uh, the Libya intervention. She's got the biggest yeah. section section of notes that I took. Was like, mm-hmm. oh wow, she helped create the the CNAS and uh, what was the other one called? Some executive. Um, well, actually, there's like three of them that did it. Mm-hmm. The Linda Thomas Greenfield, Jake Sullivan. Avril Haynes was involved in it, too. Um, and Avril Haynes, she's doing uh, uh, intelligence or something for him, right? I can't remember. Yeah, West Executive Advisors, that's what it was. Yeah. Well, and then she was, oh, was it Avril Haynes was the one that was the mm-hmm. one for Obama with all the uh, uh, drone strike stuff? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. No, she kind of wrote the playbook for it. Absolutely. Um, and that has probably created more terrorists than anything that we've mm-hmm. ever done. Uh, as a nation. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, you know, one of the absolute worst is uh, Tony Blinken. Oh, um, yeah. That, he's, uh, he's one of those true believers that the um, responsibility of the United States is to have military involvement everywhere in the world to make it sure that everybody does things our way so that we're safe. Wow. Yeah. I was surprised. To, like, that was one of the things that surprised me when they were in Iraq War uh, two, mm-hmm. and his whole thing with when uh, Biden was still a senator. Or maybe it was Iraq. When, was he still a senator? Yeah, he was, right? At the beginning of two? Yep. Yeah. Um, but uh, Blinken was helping him write out, essentially, segregation laws for Iraq based on ethnicity mm-hmm. and religion. Yeah. It's like, okay, let's, I guess it didn't work in America. Let's try it somewhere else. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's just crazy to me to think, you know, at that point in time, what was it, 2011? I can't remember. I'm probably way off. Don't no, no, me. no, no, no. Um, that, yeah, it would have been, you know, roughly 2004 to 2006, wow. probably, somewhere in there. How antiquated. Yeah. But that's who he wants to be in charge for him. Yeah. Um, yeah, you, and you can't understate how dangerous those kinds of people are. Um, the people that that are true believers in the duty to protect 
or the the what, what's the other way they say it um the um Oh, I always heard it as duty to protect. But anyway, duty you know, to the, expand. Uh, the way we <clears throat> we excuse our interventions to the American people by, well, you know, we have to go in there because there's this ethnic group that's in danger. And so we have to send our military to solve whatever kind of social problems they have in this place. And while we're there, we're going to um, secure some resources to make sure that we can continue trading. This is our and, primary goal. Yeah. Well, and then we're going to uh, give all the money we possibly can to rebuild them after the end. It's mm-hmm. like, how about we just stay out of there in the first place? Then yeah. we don't have to rebuild. We don't have to pay money to rebuild. We don't have mm-hmm. to go and change everyone's lives to be like our own. Leave them alone. Yeah. And think how much, um, how much taxpayer money goes to these kinds of programs Mm -hmm. uh that this has become such a huge business um and and the whole thing's corrupt but the this has become such a huge business that um ray mcgovern uh, a former cia uh analyst um he talks about now it's not just the military industrial complex he calls it the mickey mat um so it's military industrial uh corporate intelligence media academia think tank complex like it's become this huge thing that all of these people reinforce each other's views which are and, just lobbyists yeah and and it you know essentially lobby for more money to be spent on um on military interventions anywhere and everywhere but people they that's one of the things i was reading too that they said was that they uh it was kind of not frowned upon as much mm-hmm. because it was that think tank that was tacked on to the end or it's like well mm-hmm. it's not the same thing even though they do work with you know mm-hmm. military contracts for Northrop Grumman right. and Lockheed Martin and all these other you know gosh I wrote them down somewhere uh, General Dynamics that and was Boeing big, yeah. and um, Raytheon, Raytheon. And, um, yeah a whole bunch of them and it's like these people that are going to be in this cabinet are the ones that you know well, not all of them but the three I think that I can remember mm-hmm. are part of creating these not lobbyist lobbyist groups yeah. And those companies that we just mentioned, um, think if any of them would have any kind of income if it weren't for government contracts. I mean, Boeing would. Yeah. Um, well, Northrop wouldn't because they create warplanes. So, mm-hmm. Well, there's actually the the town I work out of in the oil field in North Dakota um, has a uh, Northrop Grumman uh, factory where they build wiring harnesses for F-18s, or Mm -hmm. I think it's F-A-18s. I just, I dated a girl there a while back, and Mm -hmm. over 10 years ago, uh, I'm married now, (laughs) but, uh, and that was, she said she built wiring harnesses, and I was like, Mm -hmm. for what? She's like, warplanes. I'm like, wow, middle of North Dakota. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Well, and that's part of it, too, is that the, like, every state gets a little bit of this, so there's an incentive for these representatives to keep maintaining these huge military budgets and so forth, because they don't want to go back home, and- and it's not the uh, it's not the government that's doing that. Actually, it's the you know Northrop Grumman and um, and Raytheon, all these companies. They divide up the production of their uh, products among all the states through all these districts, so that there's not a single representative that can oh. that can go home and say, well, yeah, I voted against the you know two thousand jobs that this company provides here in my district. Yeah, and the town it's in is a town of like twenty five hundred, mm-hmm. so it's. There's nothing there but Northrop and oil. Well, used to be oil. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then, uh, you know, tacked on to that, I, I think this is a, a reasonable transition to um, the uh, the recent pardons. And oh, yeah. it, this is just symptomatic, I think, of, of the way the U.S. government works at this point, is that, um, that Trump just pardoned all these Blackwater guys that had been uh, imprisoned. You may actually hear my cat yelling outside. I have not been home a lot recently, and she <laughs> she whining. is needy. Um, but anyway, uh, you know, pardoned all these Blackwater guys that had been um, convicted of killing civilians and uh, in our terror war. Um, I as, was never aware. Like, I always knew of Black... I've actually had a... I forget the two different terms. There's a private, there's the PMCs, and then so private military contractors, and then there was private security. So I have a friend who worked for one of the, uh, he said private security. He said he wasn't private military, but the stories he told, which I won't repeat because they're not, you know, not important, but it was uh, driving around, taking care of delegates and armored up SUVs, Mm -hmm. and his words verbatim, well, I can't, 
I want to cuss. So, you know, we're a bunch of alpha males armed to the teeth mm. uh, who got up, lifted weights, cleaned guns, and then went out and did sorties on stuff. And it mm. was like, well, where was the oversight? There wasn't any. It was just, you know, we had to take delegate from the delegate from venue A to B, mm-hmm. and that's it. And it's like, okay. And then you hear the story you were telling me the other night about, like, I didn't even know. I've avoided the news since all the election mumbo jumbo back and Mm -hmm. forth. It's like, all right, just tell me who's going to be in charge at the end. I don't care anymore. A or B. Um, But, yeah, I didn't realize they were were charged with uh, injuring 30 people, allegedly killed 17, but were charged for the murder of 14 people. Mm -hmm. And he's like, yeah, it's okay. Yeah. We'll just let them go. Oh, you know, they're they're foreigners. Mm-hmm. Who cares, yeah. right? Somewhere else in some brown people country, so it's no big mm-hmm. deal. Meanwhile, their families and, uh, what was it? I think they flew over like 30 people from Iraq to testify, mm-hmm. and it was over the course of years and years and years that they finally got the convictions, and now he says, nah, we're not going to do it. Yeah. Uh, who was it? I can't remember. Um, I don't think it was McGregor, but uh, one of these generals talked about... Uh, terrorist math this is you know what's um you know um a terror war minus two terrorists equals 20 terrorists yeah and so for every time you you kill one of these guys off you piss off the whole rest of their family and it creates a whole bunch more and it creates propaganda i mean it's 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 not even propaganda because it's true for the most part but we did um, go over there and kill a bunch of people so (laughs) it's yeah of course you're just Mm -hmm. making more and more and more enemies which is Mm -hmm. again goes back to being good for who private military contractors you're they're not they're not called blackwater anymore what are they called Uh, Yeah, they had to change names because of a branding issue. Academy. That's Mm -hmm. what it is. Eric Mm -hmm. Prince and Academy. Mm -hmm. Well, that was the other thing, too, I didn't realize. And I don't know what the exact number. They just said at one point in time there was 160,000 private military contractors over there, which is almost the same amount of American troops. Yeah. Well, I remember um, reading a a while back that um, in World War II, there were two uh, U.S. soldiers for every... Um, private contractor oh, really? working with the military and that since then that's completely flipped that um, by Vietnam it was like two contractors for every soldier and then um, by the beginning or by the Iraq war it was like four contractors Holy for every cow. soldier and I, I, I want to say that now it's more like 10 contractors for every soldier well I mean is that an argument for uh, the privatization? Well, and I guess that would be an argument against. Yeah, I mean, it it would be an argument against the privatization of the of that, except that that's not privatization because no, they're all being paid by the government, the government. still. Yeah. Um, so, you know, a private company being paid by the government isn't privatization; it's fascism. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I never thought about it in that aspect. Yeah. But while he's you know pardoning these guys. Um, people like Julian Assange and Edward Snowden are still, um, you know, well, I guess Snowden's in exile in Russia because if he ever comes back here, he'll be prosecuted under the Espionage yep. Act. And Assange, they're trying to uh, extradite, extradite from the him. UK here to um, prosecute him under the Espionage Act. And uh, the interesting thing is that they are essentially in trouble with the US government for revealing. Things like what these Blackwater guys what did. They did. Yep. Well, that was the one that I that stuck out most recent in my mind was the reality winner one, mm-hmm. where it was like, well, what did she do? And it was oh, back in was it the twenty sixteen election, where she had released information that I can't was it the NSA. Yeah, NSA. Yeah, NSA. In two thousand, or yeah, she leaked that. Uh, or 2017, sorry. So mm-hmm. she was arrested in 2017. She leaked the proof that Russia, has, Russian intelligence was trying to hack the U.S. voting machines in the 2016 mm-hmm. election, and she thought the American people should know that. Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, we should. We yeah. should know that. Well, we need to have faith in our elections, but mm-hmm. instead it's like, now she can stay in jail. Yeah. Why? Mm-hmm. But not that that was the biggest one. It's just the one that stuck out most recently in my mind. Yeah. And Assange is a really interesting case anyway because he didn't He's, leak anything. Nope. He just asked, like, hey, if, yeah. you, if you have this information, I'm, I'm willing to publish it. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll keep you yep. uh, anonymous and, as best I can and, you know, protect your identity as best I can, and I, I will get it out to people. And he's just a public—I mean, the New York Times does it every day. Um, the difference is that the, the leaks that the New York Times is 
giving to you the, you know, um, classified information that the Times releases every day. They were actually given, given by yeah, the government <laughs> you know, gave it to them. Here, we need you to put this out there. So yeah. just uh, write an anonymous source and mm-hmm. it's, it's okay. People familiar with the matter. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, Snowden, what he did was he he revealed that the U.S. government was violating the Fourth Amendment constantly, like perpetually. And lying about it nonstop. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And More yet faces. somehow James Clapper, he's, you know, I'm surprised he's not back in the next administration. Well, yeah, <laughs> that's funny too. I never thought about bringing him mm-hmm. I just, to me, it's amazing. I I was torn in the beginning because of like, you know, being in the military and taking an oath to Mm -hmm. defend your country against, you know, foreign and domestic and and that Mm -hmm. whole spiel. Um, I always, the question always came up for years on that isidewith.com website when I was trying to figure out, well, who do I agree with the most? Mm -hmm. You know, and I found that to be probably the least biased website. Um, and you could go back, what I liked about it, you could go back and verify sources like, okay, did such and such candidate actually answer these questions? Mm-hmm. And, oh, they did, okay. Or did they just pull it from, oh, this is typically what a party member would answer. Anyway, mm-hmm. um, that there was a Snowden question on there all the time, and I was always torn because it didn't give me the choice, like, should he be pardoned, yes or no? Mm-hmm. And it's like other stances, it's like, well, I don't know. I was always torn with it because of that whole, he took the same oath, mm-hmm. but... In that sense, I think he was doing the right thing. Exactly. He, he was protect protecting. and defend yep. the Constitution of the United States and protect and uphold. But I can see how some of those higher-ups would feel like, well, no, you mm-hmm. betrayed me. And yeah. it's like, well, I don't serve you. I serve the American people. Mm-hmm. But I don't know. Potato, potato to some people. Well, it, it's certainly not to me. And mm-hmm. I, I, I agree that he should be pardoned. And, of course, they, the U.S. government trapped him in Russia um, by revoking his passport while he was in flight, like in the air well, on his way to Russia. To he was him. trying to go to Brazil, I think, or I, I, can't, I remember. can't remember now, but somewhere in South America is where he was headed. Um, but when he landed in, in Moscow and tried to get on the next plane, his passport had been revoked by the U S government. So he's a man without a country mm-hmm. and, uh, they trapped him there, but it, it's a useful tool again, because now, um, you can also direct, uh, some anger towards Russia for mm-hmm. harboring this fugitive from oh, the right. U.S. And, yep, I didn't think about that yeah. either. And it was all—it's all intentional. Like this was no, this was the, no mistake. You think they did that on purpose? I absolutely yeah. do. Yeah. yeah, maybe. I suppose it does make sense. Mm-hmm. Our old enemy. Let's dr- bring that back up. Yeah, and you have to have, uh, you know, it's useful to have a scapegoat. You know, to like. Okay, so I always said, like, you have to have somebody to hate, right? Yeah. Um, so, and to blame everything on. And Russia works and China works, and this is good. It gets, especially Russia right now, yes. um, because it's still, like, there's still the echoes of the old Cold War and the Red Menace and all that stuff that the propaganda that had been fed into this country for, right. you know, 60 years. Um, and, uh, you know, now it's easy enough to come back to that. It's a terrible idea. I mean, you're talking about a country with thousands of thermonuclear warheads. We probably don't really want conflict with them. Um, China either. China has several hundred uh, thermonuclear warheads. I mean, it doesn't sound like a lot when you're comparing it to the U.S. and Russia that have thousands Thousands of these things. But 300 nuclear warheads is enough to end the United States. Well, and that's the thing that always bothered me about it, too, when people talk about nuclear war. It's like, well, where where are the missile silos for America located? There's a lot in North Dakota. I used to drive past like five or six every day on my way to work, and it's like, oh wait, yeah, they're gonna mm-hmm. they're gonna shoot them here first. Yeah. So I guess I, I wouldn't live that long. You're forcing a choice though. Yep. Do you target population centers or do you target the the weapons? The weapons themselves. Yeah. Um, but I mean, if you have three hundred or four hundred nuclear weapons, you can hit yeah, both. It doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. Um. But uh, yeah. I mean, I think that it was done on purpose. And so, as far as you know, somebody to hate like. I figured I had to pick something too. And so I chose Canadians. Canadians. You yeah. don't like Canadians. Yeah. Um. I, I decided to hate Canadians because then nobody can accuse me of being racist or, uh, you know. Um, yeah, they're the same color as you normally. Yeah, religion's essentially the same. Okay. Had a little technical problem there. Oopsie. I'm sure it was the Canadians that did it. Yep. Um, those bastards. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so what did you miss? Um, we're talking about, uh, well, I said, I was thinking this morning uh, 
about how there's essentially like three ways that a country or a, a nation state can either integrate or dominate another nation another state nation. or ethnic yeah. ethnic group. And um, I said that the uh, the Russians are concentrated on being a regional power, not a world power at this point. I mean, that may change when they have really established themselves as a regional power. It's hard to say, but um, but they've been doing it diplomatically uh, through negotiations with the surrounding nations um, and, uh, you know, support in various ways through alliances and what have you. And then that the Chinese have been doing it economically, the, you know, Belt and Road Initiative and um, they have been investing and spending and stealing and stealing yes. um, all over the world, particularly in Africa, but in Southeast Asia around them as well. They also own a lot of stuff in Canada. Mm -hmm. They own a lot of stuff everywhere. Right. Um, well, it just went to your hate of Canadians, I thought. Yeah. That's another reason. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so... Um, <clears throat> And, you know, essentially it's that they've been doing it in a lot of ways the same way that the U.S. did it years ago through the IMF and the World Bank. Oh, that's right. <clears throat> and that's the that's the part where we, I was talking about the Confessions of an Economic Hitman. And the old one. Yes. So if you haven't read it, um, you should read Confessions of an Economic Hitman, but they came out with a new version a few years ago. I think it's called The New Confessions, but um, it's the same book, but shorter. <laughs> Like they actually took information out well, of it. They didn't it add of... information to it. So find the old one. The old one's a real interesting story about a um, an intelligence operative for the U.S. that was um, helping to set up these deals uh, for IMF loans oh, okay. um, with nations. And uh, but the it w what they would do is they would create it to be a debt trap so that. They could use it as leverage to get these nations to do what the U.S. wanted to do in the long run by saying, um, essentially, like if you take a country like Venezuela, and I'm just pulling Pick this one. out of the yeah. air, but um, all right, well, so the IMF is going to give you a big loan to um, to develop your coffee plantations, uh, but in order to get this loan, you have to purchase all your equipment from the U.S. We need you to um, use Caterpillar and Bobcat and whatnot. Exactly. And uh, you're going to want to hire um, some people to help you do this, and you're going to want to hire consultants from the U.S. Okay. Uh, to do this. And um, there's these high interest rates, and um, after you pay off all this equipment and so forth, you're not going to be able to profit enough from your new venture to uh, pay off these loans. So in order to keep from forcing your country to default and, and destroy you economically, these are the things that you're going to do yep. for us. Yeah. That doesn't sound like America at all. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We would never do such a thing. Mm -mm. But you know that the Chinese are doing it. Oh, yeah. Obviously, the Chinese would do something like well, that. I like the, I don't know if you'd call it swagger that they have, where it's mm -hmm. almost like a, it's flamboyantly in your face, and it's just mm -hmm. like, well, what are you going to do about it? Yeah. Like, hey, here it is. I mean, I can deny what you're saying, mm -hmm. and you can't do anything about it. Yeah. And, and all we got to do is call in your loans. And yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's the other thing, being... Yeah being beholden to another country, mm -hmm. not in the sense of, well, I guess they do own a lot of our debt. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Uh, it, the, you know, the thing is that right now it'd be just as damaging for them as it is to us though. Um, well, not just as damaging. That's, that's not really true because they have our, so what we're producing for them is um, really meaningless paper. And what oh, they're right. producing for us is goods, like Things something that need. actually uh, generates wealth. Well, that was a fun thing to try to explain to uh, people about um, the tariffs and all that stuff when it was mm -hmm. like, you know, okay, everyone thinks Trump is doing a good thing. Even my mm -hmm. wife was on board with like, mm -hmm. well, I think he's doing a good thing. And it's like, well, we need those products that they're making to build the things that we make. So mm -hmm. it's hurting us. It's not really hurting them. Yeah. And all you're doing is you're raising costs for everything. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so how the, that's not helpful. Yeah. It, it's hurtful for lack of a better term. Yeah. It's very ungood. Very ungood, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> well, that was something that maybe you were talking about that too, about like, uh, you know, spending foreign money other places. And uh, it, Trump came out, uh, of course, on the internet. And I think I watched on Instagram him talking about the uh, stimulus package and why mm -hmm. he wasn't going to approve it. And I, I didn't take the time. I was lazy to look at, you know, he named off 
uh, some absurd amount of millions, almost trillions of dollars of aid that were supposed mm-hmm. to go to all these foreign entities. And it's like, okay, well, well why? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, I don't want that money to go somewhere else, but why is it? Why is it going somewhere else? And I know that comes from not him, but from Congress. He's the one mm-hmm. saying, I'm not going to do it. Yeah. But it's like, why, why do we... Why do we have to pay those countries that money? Mm-hmm. Who's whose thought process? Where? Why? I don't know. I know that's off subject. It's just yeah, in my and head. I, I'm not sure the specifics of it. So that's something that I'll I'll have to cover on a later podcast, mm-hmm. um, probably. Um, but what we know is historically, and it's almost certainly true with this uh, stimulus package or COVID relief, whatever they're yeah. calling it, um, is that most of it is a is a bunch of corporate payoffs. Yeah, that would make sense, and that's kind of what I was mm-hmm. thinking. Was like, okay, it's going to help all these. Wow, well, gosh, there was other. And ones they too. distract the individual citizen right. by saying, "Well, you're just going to get this free money," but in the meantime, um, what they're really paying for is a whole bunch of corporations to continue to privatize public money. Hmm. Um, it's but, so frustrating. Yeah. Um, so, but the third thing is what we're doing, which is we're trying to dominate in the world militarily. Yeah. And the way we're doing it is the one that creates the most resistance. How so? Well, because um, through diplomacy, it, it well through diplomacy and economy, um, you're at least creating the feeling. If it's not, it's mostly real in diplomacy, but you're you're creating the feeling economically, like everybody's buying in that it it's consensual okay, um, from both that. sides. Whereas when you go in militarily. No one has a choice. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I got you. Okay. You know, you don't even create the feeling that it's consensual. You're just like, we're we're coming in to tell you how to do things. It's weird, too, to think about, like, uh, to be absent-minded about that in the sense that, like, I, I've never had a foreign entity in my backyard. Mm-hmm. You know, I've never had to worry about someone shooting up my house or am I going to be, you know, an innocent bystander mm-hmm. of some sort of thing. And so we can be kind well, of Well, yeah, you could make the argument on the reservation, though. Yeah, on the reservation, or I guess I live in Nashville now, so mm-hmm. there was just a bomb that blew up downtown there right yesterday. Yeah. So it hurt absolutely no one. It sounds like well, injured two people. But. Okay. Yeah, no, it's it's a uh, yeah. I actually work for my tribal government now, mm-hmm. and uh, I've gotten to see a little bit better the inner workings of spending government money. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if I should talk about. Well, I guess they were given, I think it's $27 million that they have to spend by the end of the year mm-hmm. for the CARES Act. Okay. And if they don't spend it all, mm-hmm. we have to pay it back. And so they're literally trying to, like, wholesale fire sales. <laughs> Everything's got to go hire more people, buy this, buy that. Yeah. Um, so that Come we, on, everybody. Yep. We're going out to the strip club. Exactly. <laughs> like, hey, you know, Greg, I know we owe you this much over time. We're going to double it, mm-hmm. and we're going to raise your pay. Uh, go take vacation. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I sure will. Thanks. But. Yeah. I don't know, just the inefficacy of government mm-hmm. is it what, what it brought to mind. And I never realized how, even on a small scale, like, you know, uh, localized like that, how mm-hmm. just rampant it is. Yeah. Hmm. Well, and that's, um, in in other news, uh, I heard that Texas was going to introduce a secession bill in awesome. their state legislature. Um, and I love it. Yeah. Like, I, that's a fantastic I'm a idea. I'm huge fan. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that it was in response to the Supreme Court um, throwing out their case against the other states about the election right, uh, election fraud or whatever they were calling it. I don't think that they used fraud in that case, but um, at least mismanagement it, it invalidated of their election their process. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think that the the reason's kind of silly, but I don't think the reason's really relevant. No, I don't care. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. I, well, I, I wish more about, states would follow suit. A hundred percent. That's just what I was going to say. My neighbor and I were talking about, uh, it was when the whole thing started with, you know, oh, the, the fraud Trump stuff. Mm-hmm. And is it real? Is it not? And he just kind of said, I don't care. You know, mm-hmm. here's, here's what I think about it. I'm on team A, you're on team B. Let's meet at the flagpole at 315. We'll figure it out, which is, I mean, he's an Army vet. I'm a Marine Corps vet. Mm -hmm. Of course, my first thought process is let's automatically fist fight. We're going to skip past being diplomatic about it and doing Mm -hmm. what Texas is trying to do. But, Mm -hmm. hey, I think we should join them. I love it. I really do. But like I was saying to you, how do you do do that without creating an actual civil war? Because that's what happens, it seems like. Mm -hmm. Or that's what's happened in our history Mm -hmm. when you have differing opinions and someone wants to say, hey, we don't want to be a part of your thing anymore. Yeah. Well, and I'm not... I'm not on board for um, uh, an armed conflict. Over I don't see this. how you can avoid it, though. But um, 
but it's let somebody else take that step. Right. Right. So if Alabama were to declare its independence as a nation state and, and secede from the union, it would force the federal government to aggress. Well, okay. like, and I'm, I'm on board with defense and I, you know, so at least this way, you're not initiating the conflict. You're doing it the legal way. I mean, the constitution is a compact. It's a, it's a, a contract between nations. I mean, that's how it was formed Nation in states. the first, yeah. in the first place. And, um, so all these states were supposed to be independent sovereignties no and one to reclaim, that. yeah, to reclaim that sovereignty, I think is, is a, a noble yep. thing to do. Um, now if the rest of the states disagree and they want to, um, invade Alabama to get Alabama back in the union, then I'm happy to defend yeah. the state. Uh, well, not happy to, but well, I, right. you know. I might have to start running again. <laughs> and ammunition is really expensive. Yeah. I, the thing, you know, my, uh, my dad just passed away. So we suddenly have a whole bunch more free ammunition. Yeah, I think I actually um, got some. There's a whole, the whole closet full of ammunition. Um, but, uh, Oh, by the way, everyone, that's why I haven't, we haven't done oh, a yeah. podcast in a few weeks. Um, is that it is that my dad passed away like three days after the last podcast. So been occupied. Yes. Um, and, uh, anyway, yeah, I'm like, I'm on board with the secession thing. Absolutely. Like we, I was talking with my mom the other night that, you know, uh, using Dave Smith's thing about that the U S government was created to be the smallest government in world history. And it's yep. become the biggest. biggest, um, we are the biggest, most expensive government in the history of the world. Um, and it, it's really just kind of coming into its own in exercising its power. And you see that in the form of the surveillance state, the police state security state. Um, so truthfully, it's, I kind of feel like, well, get out now while you still can, you know, before it is so oppressive that you can't. Sinking ships in a bunch. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I agree. I feel the same way. It's like, why can't, I, I know it's easy to say, and there's a whole lot of steps involved mm -hmm. in between. Let's just, why don't we just do the same thing? Why can't we just get away? Yeah. How do you do that? I yeah. don't know. I don't, I'm not. You declare it. There's nothing that says, nothing in the U.S. Constitution that says that you can't exit the contract. It's just like any other contract. Weren't you talking about that the other night, though, that like the, the, I don't know, was it apathy? Is that the right word? That like some people, like just oh. seems like people don't care anymore. Like, yeah. They'd rather be safe and taken care of than have their liberty. Mm -hmm. And I just, I can't, I have a really hard time relating to those people or even talking to them. Mm -hmm. Well, I shouldn't say that. And then I feel bad for, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to be ageist, mm -hmm. but like my, my bonus kids, you know, they're in their twenties and trying to speak to them about what you were just saying, where the power is supposed to be in the States. That's mm -hmm. the way it was designed. And they just, it's like, they've, they don't comprehend it. They're not taught it. They don't know it. And so to try to explain it to them back the other way, I don't know that they would ever rebel, you know, they just, Oh, yeah. that's the way it is. The federal government is, is the big boss. Yeah. Well, there's some level that would incite rebellion, uh, you know, some level of oppression that would incite rebellion, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, and, and that was something that I was saying to them last night is that if you read the declaration of independence and not like, you know, not the flowery prose at the beginning that we cite all the time. Right. Um, but if you just read their, uh, their reasons for separating from the, from the British government, um, uh, you see that like the U S government now, federal government is far more oppressive than the British government that we fought a revolution to secede from, you know, 250 years ago. Yeah. That was it. The one that sticks in my mind is the 1% tax increase. And it's, <laughs> it's like, oh, okay, we went to war mm -hmm. and that was one of the things we went yeah. to war over was 1% income tax. Yeah. Well, or, but the, you know, the taxes wasn't even a big part of that. Right. Like the tax thing was like the 14th point or something, uh, you know, down the list on the, in the declaration of independence. Um, a whole lot of it was essentially about, uh, the legal system being unfair, uh, unfairly biased towards the people. Well, that's certainly that's the case now. True. Um, of course they were moving people to other, uh, venues to keep them, you know, um, away from what would maybe be a supportive, um, trial, uh, and okay. so forth. But we do that now. I mean, they, they hold various kinds oh, yeah. of trials and, um, you know, in districts around DC, for example, where they know that they're going to get a favorable, yep. like all those security state stuff, um, they hold like in Arlington, 
oh, in yeah. the you know in the Arlington district in in Virginia. Right, all of it's written. And, yeah, yeah. And like everybody time. is uh, connected to the intelligence community in some way, so of course they're going to you know support the government in these things. Give me a pick. Where do I want it? <laughs> right here on my home turf. Yeah, yeah. Home field advantage of the worst kind. Um, so we're still doing that today and, and, you know, our forefathers fought a revolution to, to get away from it. And then, um, I heard, uh, Glenn Beck, he was interviewing Megyn Kelly, but, um, he said, uh, he was talking about the collapsitarian movement, you know, this idea that we'll just like, you know, let's just, um, accelerate the decline of this country and burn it all down. Ugh. And, um, uh, and he, well, I mean, I, I don't I know. know that I'm really opposed to that as a, on the whole, but um, he said, you know, you don't want to burn it all down. It took us more than 200 years to build this. And you, my thought when he said that was like, no, you've got it completely backwards. It took us like 15 years to build this. We've been burning it down Ruining for 200 it. years. Yeah, I remember you saying that last <laughs> night made me laugh. Mm-hmm. It it feels true, though. I mean, how what was it you were saying that uh, even the forefathers, mm-hmm. who was the first one to violate? Yeah, the George Washington. One. The first <laughs> yeah. one was. Yeah. I mean, these people violated the rules that they wrote. Yeah. Um, and that they wrote in order to keep government in check. And then when they were the government, they didn't really feel strongly about that anymore all, for some reason. I forget what the <laughs> quote is. Or I remember the quote. I can't remember who said it. But, uh, you know, giving uh, giving power to politicians is like giving cigarettes and whiskey to college students. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, that makes sense. It'll corrupt anyone, I suppose. Mm-hmm. I don't know. There's a couple examples of people that I can think of that like self-imposed term limits. Uh, the I can't remember if it's a senator or governor out of Wyoming that did it. Mm-hmm. There was a governor here in, in Alabama really? that did. I didn't know. Um, I, I think that's back. admirable. Yeah. I really do. I mean, get in, get out, do what you're supposed to, represent your people, mm-hmm. and literally represent your people. Don't go in for mm-hmm. special interests and all that. I mean, that's well, I think that that's, that is representative of somebody who really is a public servant. Right. Like that that's, that's, that's their purpose. Um, now, a lot of people around me advocate for term limits to try and solve this. I don't think it would. How I would think it? that it would make it much worse, actually. How so? Uh, um, well, because I, I think that essentially what you have in um, in an elected government like ours, in a democratic republic, you know, government, is that you have a, a caretaker government. Right. Um, so they they don't actually personally benefit from long term growth. Right. Right. So they only benefit, um, as long as they are part of that government. Oh, okay. so instead of incentivizing them to look long term, So I, I, you know, part of this comes from, uh, Hans Hermann Hoppe, the democracy, the God that failed, um, where he's talking about, he's comparing monarchies to uh, democratic Republic forms of government. And he says, um, that a, a monarchy is like a private owned government and that, the Democratic Republic is a public-owned government, and therein is the problem, essentially, both. that, uh, you know, the monarchy, um, they're looking long-term because the the growth of the wealth of the entire nation is essentially a growth of their own wealth as well right. and, and for their posterity as well. Um, so they look long-term. They try and increase the, the value, the whole value um, of their, you know, their sovereignty, their estate, and everything that's yeah. going to get passed on to their progeny. Right? Exactly over time. Um, whereas in a democratic republican form of government, they the uh, the principles, the um, the people in the government only benefit as long as they're in the government. So the incentive is actually to extract as much as you can while you're there and not look long term at all. So frustrating. And so I think that if you like right now, you can be a senator for. 40 years. Uh, so you can think, all right, well, I go in there and I get little by little every year. I've got a lot of time to, to take what I can out of this and to build my own personal wealth, um, at the expense of the people. I mean, I, and I don't think that they think of it in that term, like at the expense of the people, but some of them might, some of them probably do. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't matter Mm -hmm. because the results the same. And, uh, I think that if you gave them, If you said, well, you can only be a senator for one term, like you get six years as a senator, they're like, man, I only got six years Uh, to get as much as I can out of this. Okay, I get what your point is there, yeah. So Mm -hmm. the idea is then it's not even to play ball to the smallest amount. It's like, Mm -hmm. no, I just want to make as much money as I can. Yeah, because people are self-interested. I did, uh, we were talking about people getting rich, 
in, in politics, and that was one mm-hmm. of the things. And it's not to single out AOC. It just happened to be the one that I looked up because I said, well, I wonder if she's a millionaire. Mm-hmm. And she's not. Yet. She's projected to be within the next, I think it was seven to ten years. Mm-hmm. And that was based on how much her apartment cost in D.C., because initially she'd complained about, I can't even afford to mm-hmm. live in D.C. And it was like, okay, so she's making, I think, $143,000 a year. I can't remember exactly. Yeah. It was a hundred plus, hundred and forty plus thousand mm-hmm. dollars a year. And based on what she could save and put away each month, it was like, oh yeah, she'll be a millionaire. Mm-hmm. And she was a bartender. Yeah. But I mean, and I don't know, I guess depending on which side of the boat you're on, she's trying to make change. Not my kind of change, but. Yeah. Um. I mean, we'll see though. Uh, yeah. She's, you know, got the opportunity to benefit from her position and I'm sure that she will. I mean, all that money, she, she's putting that money yeah. away. She's not giving it no. back to her community or anything. Well, that was the other thing, too, the the irony in her selling shirts that were uh, $58 a pop. Mm-hmm. And, you know, here she is, uh, you know, self-proclaimed, was it socialist or communist? Yeah. And she's profiting off of, mm-hmm. you know, capitalism. She's a democratic socialist. Yeah, that's what it is. And she's selling shirts to the public for $58 a pop mm-hmm. and profiting off of the capitalist system yeah. that she's trying to get rid of yeah. to a certain extent. Well, and, you know, Bernie Sanders was the same way. Right. You remember in the debates when uh, people were talking about, well, you made a million dollars off of that book that you wrote and, right. and whatever. He said, well, I worked hard on that book. Well, yeah, I mean, so did everybody else that has earned money in this <laughs> in this country. Like, there's very few people that just got their money out of nowhere. Right. Um, and even those that did, that inherited it, that, is it, should they be punished because it was their parents that worked for it, not them. No. I mean, because the whole point, like, I think that it is the goal of every parent to give, to leave as much as you can to your kids, yep. to give yourself the best possible or your children the best possible chance. Um, so, you know, if you work hard your whole life so that you can build up this huge savings so that you can then leave it to your kids, why should, why, why should does anybody anyone? else get a, a part of that. They shouldn't. You've already, mm-hmm. I mean, the government's already had their hands in it how many different times from, mm-hmm. oh, okay, you bought a house, now you got to pay taxes on it every year. Mm-hmm. Oh, you bought a car, I know you saved all this money, and oh, we've been taking income tax from you that mm-hmm. you're never going to see. Right. It's never going to come back to you. Um, your Social Security, depending on how old you are, doesn't exist anymore because we've mm-hmm. used it for something else. Oh, and now that, you know, let's say $500 million you saved up, we're going to take 50. Mm-hmm. Why? Yeah. You've already taken, you know, 28, 20. Yeah, this is what's left after you already took. It's so frustrating. (laughs) I don't, I Mm -hmm. don't understand it. I've always, anytime there's been anything where it's like, you know, should you vote to abolish inheritance tax or death tax? It's like, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, all taxes. I don't know. That's a weird one to get into though, too. Yeah. And we don't have time. No, I know. (laughs) So, um, is there anything else that, uh, you wanted to talk about before we wrap things up here? Um, I'm glad we did this. I'll have to purchase a microphone or I, I don't know how Skype or Zoom or whatever mm-hmm. would do. It was yeah. fun. Well, um, yeah, you'll definitely want a nicer microphone than just like your computer yeah, I microphone that. or a headset microphone to do Skype. But yeah, um, man, I would be happy to have you on here to co-host any, any time. I, uh, it'd be fun too to help sit in with Larry or listen so mm-hmm. I can have someone else to bounce dumb ideas off of. You can, <laughs> I like Larry's, uh. It's not comic relief that he adds. It's a, He actually adds to it. Mm-hmm. But his ability to kind of pull out of you to break it down for the blue-collar guys like me where it's like, <laughs> okay, Mike's getting wordy. What do you mean? Yeah. <laughs> so, no, I enjoy it. I love the podcast. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wish I had more of a commute anymore. It used to be an hour drive each day so I mm-hmm. could listen to one or two, and now I have four-tenths of a mile drive to work. So I don't Well, that's so nice much. too, though. Yeah, it is nice. I, mm-hmm. I think I spent... Uh, what, one tank of gas lasts me about a month in a V8 pickup truck. So Sweet. Yeah. Well, um, I just have one more thing before we go, um, and that's just to point out to everybody, for, for those who were listening that doubted me months ago when I said that uh, the vaccine isn't going to put an end to all the restrictions either, that now we have the vaccine and they immediately started putting out excuses why we had to continue under these authoritarian mask mandates and lockdowns and social distancing rules and so forth. So just know that anytime that you grant power to the government, you're never getting it nope, back. They're keeping it. Yeah. They're always keeping it. And um, on that note, uh, we'll be back. Well, you know, I'm going to say that we'll be back in a week. Who knows? Um, but yeah, it's... Uh, Things keep happening. <laughs> <laughs> Things just keep happening. Um, but we will try to be back in a week uh, when we finally get this right. And in the meantime, try and stay free.
All right. You don't have a little catchphrase that you, you know, want to I get did, at the I, end? That's <laughs> one thing. I took notes. I didn't think of the catchphrase. Um, <laughs> and any one I had would probably be inappropriate. So, okay. Um, all right. Well, we're going to muzzle the Marine then. There you go. <laughs> Stay safe. <laughs> all right. Ciao.